All right, everybody, hey, welcome to uh, Challenges in the Streets on this uh, beautiful Friday. Here we are at the training school, and um, today we're going to talk about some forcible entry techniques and tactics with uh, Captain Robert James from the RVFD. But before we start, you know, usually Chief Davis is up here giving everybody a little tidbit about whatever being hydrant or heavy water hookup or whatever it is, and uh, he is unable to be here today. But recently, uh, when I was teaching the recruit class, uh, I found something. We were in the single family dwelling. We were running attack lines in the front door. Um, we have all done it in fire one class, fire two class, recruit class, whatever it is. And we changed something a little bit. Uh, actually, before they could go in the front door, they had to put a little water into the second story window. And I was up there, and the effects of that were really amazing to me. So I took some video of it on my phone. It just, it didn't turn out like I wanted it. So I had Eric Campbell uh, film it. And it's really amazing what happens to the water when it's applied from the outside to the inside. But before we show the video, I want to read something. And it's our IR IRP. And you know, I don't generally do this, but I, I think the two kind of go hand in hand. In our IRP, in the Appendix D of the IRP, the Structure Fire Appendix, on page three, it says something, and I'm going to read this verbatim. In order to prevent rapid fire growth, one or more of the, of the legs of the fire triangle, heat, fuel, oxygen, must be removed. During structure fire operations, the removal of fuel is unlikely, leaving the reduction of heat energy and the removal of oxygen as, a cru as crucial requirements. Based on these facts, MCFRS uses fast water coordinated ventilation approach to improve survivability and reduce property loss. Fast water means using the fastest, most direct method possible to put water on burning surfaces. And that's really where this video that I'm gonna show you comes into play. The emphasis on surface cooling because surface cooling is typically the least complex and most readily executed form of cooling available. And then goes on to say coordinated ventilation means limiting the creation of flow paths until water is being applied to the burning surfaces. So let's go ahead and play that video. So as you saw in that video, we only put water into that room, I don't know, five seconds, six seconds. It wasn't any big delay making entry into the front door of that structure. But you saw how the water, obviously it had to hit the ceiling, it had to break into little droplets, but just that five or six seconds of water application completely, completely covered that room and covered the potential burning surfaces with water whether that was buying you a little bit of time, whether it was resetting the fire, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, and again, I'm not here to teach you tactics. I'm just showing you something that after years of teaching, years of being an officer, I was amazed by the footage and I wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, one more thing before we get started. If you are a, uh, a CCO and you want COPDI credit, there is now a link under the description on the YouTube uh, that link went live, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes ago and will remain up for about an hour after the show. Um, that all is run by Chief Gibson. Uh, he just wanted me to include that. So uh, until then, uh, I'm, let me introduce uh, <laughs> Captain James and go ahead. Hey guys, good afternoon. My name is Captain uh, Robert James. I'm a captain with the uh, Rockville Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, I've been a member of Rockville for uh, a little over 20 years now and uh, do a lot of our training within the uh, Rockville Volunteer Fire Department. I, sh I do a lot of forced entry training with uh, a lot of the staff, career and volunteer at Station 3 in Rockville and uh, happy to be here today at the, uh, at the uh, training for you guys. Uh, so today, a couple things we're going to talk about. We're going to go over uh, a series of things. We're going to talk about our tools uh, that we use in forced entry, the tools that we have on the apparatus 
here in Montgomery County and in Rockville Volunteer Fire Department. We'll talk a little bit about size up, our size up process, what our size up process entails, things that we want to look for, things that we want to uh, be able to identify before we get into it. We're going to talk about tactics, different type of tactics for different doors that are presented to us. And then we're going to talk about just some of the challenges. As you guys are all well aware, this uh, program is challenges in the street. And so we want to talk about some of the different types of challenges that uh, we are faced with in force for entry, especially uh, here in Montgomery County and some of our urban areas of the county. Uh, although it might seem a little basic or uh, very mundane, I would like to spend just a little bit of time talking about our tools and the types of tools that we use. All right. So everybody is well aware that our irons, our set of irons, consist of a flathead axe and a halligan bar. One thing that I do want to point out um, that is important for uh, everybody to be aware is the type of axe that we are using. Uh, we have transitioned to using eight pound flathead axes, whereas before, if you guys have been around for a long time here in Montgomery County, you know that we used to use six pound axes. One of the reasons why we converted to eight pound axes is, the, is for the reason of our halligan bar, our standard halligan bar usually weighs about eight and eight and a half pounds. We found over time that we had to work harder to make the halligan bar move in tight spaces because of the, uh, the weight of the axe. So uh, the reason why we want to uh, make sure our, our axe is eight pounds is because as we are striking our halligan bar with the eight pound tool, we are using two tools that are comparable in weight, if that makes sense. So if I have a eight pound tool hitting another eight to an eight and a half pound tool, I don't have to work as hard to make that tool move as if I did a six pound tool to an eight pound tool, if that makes sense. All right, so again, this our common set of irons here in Montgomery County, Rockville Volunteer Fire Department, uh, using a eight pound flathead axe to a standard halligan bar, which generally is about eight to eight and a half pounds. Uh, when we talk about our halligan, all right, there's a couple features that uh, I would like to point out, especially when we get into uh, the later portion of this segment, which is the challenges. All right, everybody's aware of the, uh, the parts of the halligan, which our standard parts is we have the adds, all right, our pike, the shaft of the tool, our forks, all right. One of the things that I like to put emphasis on, especially if uh, you are senior people, trainers or instructors in your companies, is making sure that we know the parts of the halligan. Uh, it's very easy for somebody to uh, position the tool in inappropriately, and if we need to correct it, we want to know what part of the tool we want them to correct. So for example, um, one of the most important parts of the tool is our concave side or our bevel side, all right? So it's important that we talk about we want the bevel side of the forks to the door, or if we want the bevel side to the frame. And there's different applications for either or, all right? So that's our standard uh, halligan, the parts of the halligan. Um, when we get deep into the halligan, talking about little, little intricate parts, when we get deep into it, we talk about our shoulders. And our shoulders is a good portion for uh, striking when we get into tight space force for entry. And we start talking about our challenges later on today. I know one of the biggest points of contention in any firehouse is uh, do we wrap the halligan or do we not wrap the halligan? I know anywhere you go, that's something that's always talked about. It's always one of those things, this shift likes to wrap it, this shift does not like to wrap it. Here's just my thought on wrapping a halligan. If your halligan is set up where you have squared shoulders and your halligan set up for you to do tight space forcible entry, I would always suggest to people not to wrap the halligan. Mainly because if we're gonna slide the ax down the shaft of the tool, striking the shoulders, having a halligan wrap makes it hard. If so, you really, really wanna have your halligan wrap I would highly suggest that you only wrap the top portion of it, leaving the middle to the bottom of the, uh, or the top of the shoulders, leaving that unobstructed by having a wrap. So that's just uh, one of the things that always comes up. Do we wrap the halligan? Do we not wrap the halligan? It's always uh, one of those things, you know, you always have points of contention. So that's something to consider. If your shoulders are not squared, they're still rounded out, it doesn't really matter if the, if the halligan's wrapped or not. So just, you know, very basic things that we talk about when it comes to force for entry. Um, last but not least, I would like to just point out just uh, an option as officers. Uh, as an officer, 
I like to carry a shorter halogen. I have what we call a boss's bar, which is 24 inch halogen. It's a little shorter than your standard 30 inch halogen, as you can see, which makes it easier for me to be able to have a smaller tool if I need to, and to be able to help go hands on with, with the crew members if I need to help them as well. Uh, and then this is something that's been uh, a really helpful tool here in the fire service, especially when we get to force for entry and single person force for entry is having these metal wedges. Uh, these metal wedges are great if we need to progress capture or if we need to gain a gap if we're by ourselves. A lot of time as an officer, we might find ourselves in a position where our crew might be stretching a line or our other members might be throwing ladders or something of that nature. And here we are trying to force the door by ourselves. So having a wedge is very helpful. Um, I can put the wedge in position, gain my gap, make force for entry a thing for me while I get it ready for all the other members that are getting ready to stretch into the structure. So in a nutshell, those are mainly our basic principles of our tools for force for entry. If you guys have any questions about the tools, drop them in the comment section and I'll have some of the, uh, the people here read them off and we can we can help you uh, with your questions. All right, so um, one of the next points of, uh, of what we want to talk about here today is our size up process. All right, so I like to tell people all the time the size up process starts long before we even get the call. One of the biggest things I like to do is get out, walk the area, see what's going on in your first due area. See what you have in your area, figure out what your game plan is going to be for when you get dispatched to these runs. Our size up process then goes from being able to pre-plan to now when we get the, the receipt of the run. So when we get the call, first thing we want to process, and this is just one of my step-down processes, is what kind of area are we going to? Are we going to a residential area? Or are we going to a commercial area? It's important that we know this because our tactics, our tactics are going to be different for commercial structures versus residential structures. Generally, in residential areas, our doors swing inward. And generally, for commercial areas, our doors swing outward. I like to use the word generally because I can take you to many places here in Montgomery County and show you a residential area where the door swings outward and a commercial area where the door swings inward. So we don't want to always be so focused on the fact that it's always got to be this or that. But again, that's something that we want to think about in our size of process. So once we decide, all right, we're going to a residential area or commercial area, we get our wheels spinning on which, uh, which way the doors are generally going to swing. When we get into the block, I like to try to put eyes on the structure as much as I can. I like to see physically with my eyes where we're going prior to uh, getting off the rig. That way I can already have my game plan figured out and I already know when I get to the door, I'm not going to be fumbling at the door, flipping the tool around, doing what we call baton twirling, which is I'm at the door flipping the tool around because I'm not sure which way I want to position the tool. And then when I get to the door, there's a couple quick things that I want to go down, go down and hear what they, here's what they are. First, what is my door made out of? Is my door made out of wood? Is my door made out of metal? What is my frame made out of? Is my frame made out of wood? Is my frame made out of metal? What's the combination of the two? Do I have a metal frame, metal door? Do I have a metal frame, wood door? I can have any of those combinations. Next, what is my frame built into? Is my frame built into a studded out wall? or is it built into a block and brick wall? If I have a frame that's built into a studded wall, nine out of 10 times, I could probably get that, that frame to flex a little bit in that studded out wall because the wall has a little more give. If I'm trying to force a door and a block and brick wall, my frame my frame's not gonna flex at all. I'm not gonna get it to go anywhere. So those are some other things that you wanna think about. Which way does the door swing? Does the door swing in and to the left or does the door swing in and to the right? My tactics are generally going to be different depending on which tactic I'm using, depending on which way that door swings, if that makes sense or not. How many locks are on the door that I can see? How many locks are on the door that I can physically see? How many locks are on the door that I can't see or I think might exist? Obviously, when we run into commercial structures, and today we're spending a lot of time talking mainly on residentials, but when we run into our commercial structures, Generally, when we start talking about our Bravos, our Charlies, and our Delta sides of the structure, those doors are probably going to present a little more challenging to us than our, our Alpha side doors. So again, it's important that you get out and go look at your area and see what you have uh, to see what, what those challenges are that present to you. 
And then last but not least, before I make entry on this, we always say it, but we want to actually try before we pry, right? Obviously, if I can open up the door and the door was never locked to begin with, it's much more easy and much more faster. I like to tell people all the time, the whole fire ground operation, uh, depending on, you know, what your beliefs are, the engine does all the work, the truck does all the work, or the squad does all the work. My honest opinion, the whole operation hinges off of forceful entry. If we have good, effective, forceful entry, then everything else goes pretty smoothly after that. For as much time as we spend out here on the door, forcing the door, trying to get the door to go, that's uh, pretty much the intensity of the fire changing on the other side of it. So we want to make sure that we can be able to get into the door quick and be able to get our, our crews to get their lines in the position quickly based off of good, effective force for entry. So with that being said, I would like to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some of our tactics and our different types of tactics for residential and we're swinging doors. Hey, if you guys got any questions about anything so far, the tools, the size of the process, please drop them in the comment section and uh, I'll have them read them off and we can address them as they pop up. I would love to answer any questions that anybody might have. Uh, and again, if I don't know the answer to the question, I'll, we'll spend a little time trying to figure it out amongst ourselves. All right. So we're going to get into the tactics section. And uh, what I would like to do is bring up two of my, uh, my buddies here, uh, Ben Chen, who is a firefighter in the Rockville Volunteer Fire Department, and my buddy Eric Campbell, who is a career guy. And um, he's a career guy station three as well. Obviously, this is uh, Rockville driven. But um, what I would like to do is go over uh, a few tactics. Uh, when we talk about tactics for residential doors, specifically inward swinging doors, we have three major tactics that we talk about. All right. Our three major tactics that we have is our ads technique, which is we do everything generally with the ads in our workstation. We have our fork technique, which is we start off with the forks, transitioning to the ads, and then we have our baseball bat swing. All right. So real quick, um, and I talked to Captain Miller about this prior to this starting. I wanted to spend just a brief moment talking about our baseball bat swing and it being a tactic that's not necessarily one of my favorites, but it is a tactic that we should all know how to do. Um, tactic. Our, uh, our point is what we're trying to do is drive the, the pike of the Halligan into our frame. All right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive the pike of the Halligan into our frame and we're rotating the pike of the Halligan into the door. Therefore, we're getting the ads to push on the door. Not necessarily is it one of my favorite tactics, mainly because it requires a lot of space. All right. So if you think about it, and this is one of our challenges that we're going to talk about later here in the challenges in the street, is one of our challenges that we have is the amount of space that we have to do this. So if I have a tight hallway, uh, a residential uh, apartment building, I don't necessarily have the space to be able to swing a tool all the way around like that, especially when we have other crews in there. We have a truck crew, uh, engine crew. We have a, a, a whole set of adults with SCBAs and PPE on. We don't really have a lot of space to be pushing people away to make that tactic work. Another thing that we, is a must for us to do that tactic, we have to have a wood frame. So in order to be able to do a baseball bat swing, the frame has to be wood, all right? Here's the deal. Most of the props that we have in the American Fire Service to train on are generally metal. Uh, so we don't really have the means to most of the time practice this technique without having a wood block inserted into the frame or a wood block piece that we could attach to the frame. So a lot of those stars have to align generally uh, for us to be able to do the baseball bat swing technique, which, again, I'm not discouraging people from doing it. It's just not one of my favorite techniques because of all those variables. And last but not least, one of the most important things is most of us have to be able to be good enough to say, I want to put this pike into that spot and be able to hit that spot dead on on the first shot. And it usually doesn't go that way for us. So, Cap, did you have somebody that had a question? So, yes, we do have a question that came up in the chat. And it really it has a little bit to do with the tools, but also maybe the technique that you're talking about right, right now. And that's titanium halogen bars. Yeah. And it would be the weight savings, of the, your opinion, weight savings versus loss of, loss of mass if we're going to use a technique like that. Could you kind of talk of that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So um, titanium halogen bars are uh, they're pretty cool to have. 
We don't see many of them floating around in Montgomery County. There's some companies that have them, but uh, there's not a lot of titanium halogen bars floating around. So here's some thoughts on the titanium halogen bar. Uh, if you've never held one before, I would suggest trying to uh, find a company that does have one, just so you can see what it is and what it's, what it's like. Titanium halogen bars are super light. Uh, they're very, very uh, much have the same characteristics of every other halogen. You still have your ads, you still have your pike, shafting, your forks. The only difference with the titanium halogen bar is when you go to put it in position. Uh, if you take in a window, if you go to put it in, in, in a door, sometimes it just doesn't have that weight that you need. Now, if we're talking about driving the tool, we'll be plenty of fine, especially when I talked about earlier having tools that are comparable in weight, if not more. So, for example, if I had a titanium halogen bar that weighed five or six pounds and I'm hitting it with an eight pound tool, I'll have no, no, no problem making that tool move, just as well as I explained having an eight pound tool, hitting it with another eight pound tool. The only thing I would honestly say, and this is just my opinion, is it just feels different. It really does. Um, but as far as it being able to maneuver and doing all the same things that a regular halogen bar does, sure, absolutely, it does work. Uh, and again, it even works even better, but the problem is we don't have a lot of them in the county. There's uh, very few companies that have them, and they're floating around here or there, but it used to be a thing way back in the day in the early 2000s. A lot of companies had titanium halogen bars. So, all right. Um, yeah, Cap, if you have any more questions, just throw them up and I'll, uh, I'll address them if, as best as I can. All right, so tactics. Um, we pretty much talked about the baseball bat. What I would like to do right now is just get into talking about the ads technique uh, and then we'll jump into the fork technique. So um, I'm going to let um, Ben and Eric, I'm going to let them uh, start off by uh, showing you guys the ads technique. And I'm going to I'm going to explain what they're doing as they do it. So one of our most important things that we want to do uh, when we're going to go with the ads technique is we want to position the halogen in the right spot. It's kind of hard to show you guys on a door prop where we want to gauge the spot, but generally, if you can figure out where your doorknob is, roughly four to six inches above or below your doorknob is where you want to be. Personally, I like being above the doorknob because it puts everybody in a position where they're working uh, without having to be uncomfortable ducking or having to work over each other, unless we're in those situations where we have to position our bodies in that way. So generally, four to six inches above or below the lock, all right, and we want to put the ads in, so we're driving the ads in between the door and the frame. Uh, sometimes we might be able to just walk up to the door and swing our ads in and be in, but if not, sometimes we might have to work for that gap. So we might have to have our, our, our uh, second person Tap the back of the ads. Okay. Where, where do you want him? Just saying. Just so that we can see. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So we're not Would it be better if I go over there? No, you're good if you work from that side. All right. We'll use that camera. All right. So um, we just might have to have that other person tap the ads in so we're in position. All right. One or two hits should have us in position. And then we always want to make sure that we rotate the bar opposite the pipe. So for this particular door, this door swings in and to the left, opposite the pipe, it means Ben's gonna rotate the bar straight down just like that, all right? Every gap that we create, we wanna progress capture, so we can use the flathead axe, we can put that in there to, to progress capture that gap. Or if you guys have door chalks, you can take a door chalk out of your helmet, jam that in the gap, or if, uh, if you have the metal wedges, those metal wedges work great. We have our gap, we wanna do a one-for-one -one trade, so I have the gap, I wanna hold that gap, what I would like to do now is be able to get the ads on the back side of the frame. I like to tell people all the time, if we get daylight on the back side of the, back side of the door, that's a home run. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the ads on the back side of the frame. And then what Ben likes to do is just push the ads back to make sure that we have the ads all the way on the back side of the actual frame. Before we pop the door, what he's going to do is he's just going to make sure that the person he's coming over is going to clear it. So he either wants to push, push this person back or have this person be below him, either or, just we want to make sure we get that spot clear. As we push on the door a little bit, we're going to take a little bit, and then we always want to push our ads on the back side of the frame 100%. If I have more of the ads on the back side of the frame, that's a home run. Take that all day, all right? So what's going to happen here, force the door. Control the door, and this would be the point where everybody would drop down and mask up. 
Obviously, this is something that we can do while the hose line is being stretched. The person that's on the forced entry position, whether you're on the chalk or the squad, can get ahead of that line to get to the door to get that door forced. At that time, once they got the door forced, they can just peel off to the side, mask up, while the engine company or anybody else can just go through, push the door open to get through. That is the simplest way to tackle the, uh, the ads technique. What we'll do here is we'll, uh, we'll, I'll reset the door and then we'll just do it in full time so you guys can see it. Awesome. All right, if you guys have any questions about the ads technique, drop them in the comments section. I'm going to transition into talking about our fork technique, which is generally going to be our two-person operation. All right, so with our fork technique, all right, generally the most important part is we want to get the forks to steer towards the actual frame. A lot of times people lay up a little short when they're positioning isn't exaggerated. We want to have the position really exaggerated to the frame. If we try to come too steep first, what ends up happening is we don't get the tool to actually bite the way we want it to. All right, so we want to make sure that the forks are coming in on an angle so that they actually hit the frame. And then off of our commands, every hit, we're going to rotate the bar. It's important that no matter where you work at, where you volunteer at, that your terminology is the same. We want to make sure that we're saying the same thing. We understand what we're saying. We work off of three commands at Rockville, which is hit, drive, stop. Um, that's the common terminology that everybody knows uh, and everybody's familiar with those terms. Hit means exactly what it is. I want to deliver a hit to the tool to, uh, to help move that tool in position. Drive means go to town. Go to town, don't stop until I say stop. And at such times, stop. And then let that person reposition the tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let these guys set up, and I'm going to show you two of the most important parts of their positioning. All right? So first and foremost, Ben, he's positioned where he's bringing the, the forks to the frame. And uh, you can see his hand position where he's bringing his hand up to the Halligan versus having his hands on the top of the Halligan, mainly for the reason that uh, if for some reason you're working with somebody that you're not familiar with, they don't hit you, your, your wrist is protected by the ads. Ben's always going to be looking at the forks. His main job is to watch those forks and steer them into position. He never has to turn around and look at Eric. He knows Eric's going to not hit him by just making sure Eric has good techniques. We're going to pause for one second. I want to put this camera over here so we can get a little better shot. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, that's it. It'll only take us two seconds. Yeah, we just want, I want to, I want to be able to show everybody what you're talking about. I don't want to see your back. Oh, that's all right. Are we still alive? They're still watching? Yeah, we're live. Hey, guys. We good? We good? We're good. Go ahead. Sorry. That's all good. All right. So, again, Ben's got his positioning where his hand's coming up to the Halligan versus coming down to the Halligan. Again, he does this just for the rare circumstance. He may be having to work with somebody he's not familiar with. He doesn't want that person to hit him by mistake. And if that person which I'll go over in a minute, his positioning, he should never hit, hit Ben. So Ben's hand comes up to the Halligan. His wrist is protected by the ads. Ben's always got his eyes on the forks, and Ben's sole job is to steer that tool. Now, this setup can be any type of configuration. It can be an officer and a backstep firefighter. It can be two officers, all right? It can be any configuration. If it was two officers, then we have two Halligans in conjunction with each other, all right? So that's, that's the Halligan position. The ax position, this position, this person's down on one knee. He has one knee down, one knee up, and he just has a nice wide stance so that he doesn't fall into Ben, all right? For every hit that Ben calls, he's sending the tool straight up and down. 
So we never turn the tool sideways. We keep the tool straight up and down. And for every hit, uh, we're going to hit this sweet spot of the halogen right here. This is the sweet spot of the halogen. If I hit this spot every time, I'm sending energy down the tool to the forks from this spot. If for some reason Eric was to lay up short, well, then we still don't hit bend. We just have the handle of the tool actually hit the, the ads, and we're put in a better position where we don't hit them. So these two will work off of the commands hit, drive, stop, which for after each hit, what Ben does is he rotates the bar around till we get in the point where the tool now is deep into the door and the frame, and we can gauge a little of the daylight or the smoke on the back side of the door, and we can drive it until we get to the point where the jam is in line with uh, the top of the crotch of the bar of the Halligan. This particular bar has a jam line on it, so we know we're in far enough. And at that time, we can then rotate the forks on the back side of the frame to get the door to go. After we transition from having the, the, the gap, we just slowly go back to the same steps as we did with the ads. Once we have the gap, we hold that gap, get the ads on the back side of the frame, force the door. Again, the same process, same situations. After we get the door forced, we can mask up, and then we can go ahead and force it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reset the door, and then I'll let them do it in full time. And at this point, now they have the ability to mask up. I always like to tell our guys, just peel off to the side so you're not in the way, um, not to get into a long, drawn-out science class, but now we're in the flow path or in the police world, they call this a fatal funnel. We just peel off to the side. We can keep our tool in there, keep control of the door. And then if there's a crew that's ready to go in, there's a line that's ready to go in, all you got to do is push the door, take your tool back, and they push the door open, and they can go in and go do what they need to do. A lot of times, the engine company is usually the first ones through the door uh, after the force for entry because of the mask up process, so on and so forth. So that's our ads technique. That's our fork technique. And we, we kind of touched on, on the baseball bat swing uh, technique. Now let's get into the challenges. Let's talk about the challenges that we have. We've had a few challenges here uh, on some recent fires in Montgomery County. Um, which I've heard from a bunch of guys, which is uh, pretty cool to hear these different challenges. And uh, again, I like to tell people all the time, uh, everything that we do in the fire service is pretty much a firefighter one or firefighter two skill. What makes these skills complicated is the variables that we get to them. Forcible entry skill is a skill that we learn in fire one and fire two. So when we get these variables, that makes the skill itself a little harder, right? So not just forced for entry in an open space, but now we have forced for entry in a tight space. We have a hallway that uh, we, we don't have much room. Or we have to make entry down into a, a basement where we have to go down the stairs, and then we have three sides of a wall. So those are the variables that make these, these challenges a little hard. Um, one of the things that you guys can practice uh, in your company is um, just drawing little lines in front of your doorway and just going over movements. Obviously, having good communication is important when the guys are talking to each other and they're using the good commands, hit, drive, stop. Or when they're in a position where, like these guys, have worked with each other for a long time, uh, both being members of Rockville, training with each other for a long time. Now we start learning how to do nonverbal communication. So communication where I don't have to tell Ben or I don't have to tell Eric what to do. They know how to kind of read each other's minds and know what the move is, where the next person is going to be. 
When we get into a tight space, it might have to be one of those situations where Ben might have to position himself. He might have to get low. And he might even have to bring the tool up above his head. And Eric might have to work above him or below him. So those are just the types of things that we have to know how to navigate, especially when we get into uh, uh, situations where our visibility starts to uh, be uh, challenging for us, uh, where we can see very little or not see at all. Uh, so having nonverbal communication is important. One of the things that um, I would like to point out when we talk about nonverbal communication When we talk about nonverbal communication, talking about sounding the halogen, all right? So when Ben puts the halogen in position, sometimes if we find ourselves in these environments, we're in an apartment building, our visibility is uh, very low to actually none. Uh, what we like to do is call sound the tool, which is when Ben calls for the hit, we just tap the tool real quick just to make sure it's there, and then we actually deliver the blow. That, becomes a system. He calls for the hit, we tap it just to make sure it's there, and then deliver the blow. After each hit, Ben rotates the tool and Eric moves with him, but we keep that same rhythm going. Hit, tap, boom, hit, tap, boom. And then we know we get into this rhythm that the tool is there. Another thing that we can do in a smoke-filled hallway is we can just find it. If I have to be in a position where Ben's, he's solely trying to look at the forks, I just try to find where Ben is bring myself to the tool, try to orient myself to it, and then I know where it's at. So when Ben calls for the hit, I got my hand here. All I gotta do is bring the ax to it, just make sure I'm good, and then come back and then deliver the blow. Depending on the length of the door, I can do something like position the ax in front of me with the handle on the ground, and now we only work at the height of the two tools, but again, sometimes your doorknob's up a little higher, or if you have a lock higher than that, it becomes something that you have to face. So having that communication, is important. So let's do one where we uh, we sound the tool as we uh, as we do the fork technique. So being able to have that correlation of he knows what Ben's doing, Ben knows what Eric's doing. We train together. We know how the tool is supposed to sound. We know where the tool is. Is all good uh, nonverbal communication just based off of training together, working together. One of the things that I would strongly encourage anybody is if you have a shift uh, that's a consistent shift of people that always work together all the time, being able to have good communication and then being able to have good nonverbal communication, being able to look across a hallway or look across a yard and be able to sign something to somebody and they know what that means, especially somebody that you work with on a regular basis. Um, and then last but not least, again, just making sure that we understand all of the things that are happening around us. Uh, I reference football a lot because I'm, I'm a football head, I love football, but good practice uh, and understanding what each player does on a team there's nothing more than any different than what we do, right? Knowing exactly who's going to be where, who's going to be operating where, and what their mission is, what they're going to be doing next. If I know that an engine company is bringing a line through this door, I need to make sure I get this door open quickly and not be in their way so that they can get to what they need to do. And just as much as if I was operating on an engine company, knowing that I don't want to be up on the door because I need to allow them room to work on the door. So it's just a little give and take, and especially if you run with the same companies on a regular basis, you know the, the players that you're running with. It makes it all so much easier.
I think we hit all of the main things that we wanted to hit. We talked about the tools. We talked about the size up process. We talked about our three techniques to add the uh, forks, the baseball bat swing. And we talked about our challenges, which has been uh, a big thing here uh, recently, especially having fires in apartment buildings. Uh, the last couple ones that we've had, you know, obviously Silver Spring, uh, Westlake, uh, and 26's area. These challenges that we had where we had to do forceful entry in tight spaces, in zero visibility. And again, I think all of these things were very successful because of the players involved on those incidents, uh, the communication that they have, and, and, and being able to uh, effectively work and train together. So, uh, Cap, I, I think I'll hit them all for you. Cap, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming out here. Uh, again, everybody, uh, we want to take the time to thank uh, the captain and uh, taking a little bit of time out of his Friday to come and talk to us. Where am I looking here? Right here. Uh, um, talking a little bit to us uh, this Friday, this beautiful Friday. And we are currently working on a couple of things. We're trying to, our, to, go, to have the ability to go remote, which is going to open up an entire new gamut of uh, topics that we can talk about. Uh, we currently have a elevator one in the works. I'm hoping to put that together by next month. Unfortunately, we do not have the date for that yet. Uh, but as a reminder, uh, kind of coming to an end here, if you are a, uh, a CCO and want COPDI credit for it, go ahead. You have about an hour or so to uh, click on the link and fill out the Google form. And Chief Gibson will take care of that. So until next time, please stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.